Good evening, Oakwood. Go ahead, stand up. We're going to sing some praise. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. And I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let through the calm and through the storm Oh no, you never let go In every high and every low Oh no, you never let go Lord, you never let go of me hey. And I can see a light that is coming For the heart that holds on A glorious light beyond all compare there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, we'll live to know you here on the earth. And I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go Through the calm and through the storm Oh no, you never let go In every high and every low Oh no, you never let go Lord, you never let go of me You never let go of me Oh no, you never let go Coming through the storm, oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. I can see a light yeah. coming, Jesus. I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on, and there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes. Still I will praise you, still I will praise you. One more time, you said. Yeah, I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. And there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes. Still I will praise you, still I will praise you. Storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. Oh, you never let go of me, Jesus. Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh. Lord, you never let go of me. Lord, you never let go of me. Come on, church, amen. Somebody today, give God his praise. Woo. How's everybody doing tonight? Awesome. Sounds good. We got a couple quick announcements. Our class 401 on effective witnessing has been canceled. It was going to be tomorrow. It's going to be sometime in May. We'll let you know when that is. And if anyone's not on a Bible study, we'd love to have you come to our Wednesday night Bible study. We are starting a new study this Wednesday. Dan's excited because it's the book of 
Revelations. So come join us for that. If you're not in a Bible study, even if you are, you can still join us. And about three or four weeks ago, I think our land loan was around $12,000. Uh, last week, we were down to a little over 10000 This week, we are at $8,300. That's right. Give yourself a hand. So if anybody needs something uh, extra to do with that uh, refund you're getting for your tax refund, that's a, just a quick little note there. All right, let's get back to some awesome worship music. Thank you. Every secret, every shame, every fear, every pain, live inside the dark, that's not who we are, we are children of the day, so wake up sleeper, lift your head, we were meant for more than this, fight the shadows, conquer death, make the most of the time we have left. We are the light of the world. We are the city on the hill. We are the light of the world. We got it, we got it, we got it. Let the light shine. We are the light of the world. We are the city on the hill. We are the light of the world. We got it, we got it, we got it. Let the light shine. We got a new one for you. Saturday was silent, and surely it was true. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? And Friday's disappointment, and Sunday's empty too. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Cause this is the sound of dry bones rattling. And this is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Hope in the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Cause this is. 
Here's the sound of dry bones rattling August Pentecostal fire It's stirring something new You're not gonna run out of miracles Anytime soon In resurrection power It rides in my veins too I believe there's another here in this room, come out. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. And this is the praise make a dead man walk again. Just open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Cause this is the sound of dry bones rattling. Can you hear him rattle? Can you hear them rattle? Oh. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants. Come on, just as the man who was thrown on the bones of Elijah. If there's anything that he can do, just as the stone that was rolled at the tomb in the garden, what happened with God says to move? I feel him moving it now, I feel him doing. Sound of dry bones rattling And this is the slaves Make a dead man walk again You soap in the grave I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again Hope in the grave I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again Hope in the grave I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again this is the sound of dry bones rattling. That's right. Come on, church. Amen. Woo. You guys are alive today. That's right. I better hear every person in this room singing this. You've heard it. You know it. So now's your time. Come on. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I'm found Was blind But now I see So clearly Come on, sing this chorus And hallelujah Grace like rain Falls down on me And hallelujah and all my stains are washed away. They're washed away. Oh. Twas grace, twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace and grace my fear. My fears relieved. Woo! How precious, dear, 
that grace appear the hour I first believe. Come on, somebody in this room today, you lift your voice and sing Jesus. And hallelujah, grace like rain falls down on me. And hallelujah, and all my stains are washed away. They're washed away. When we've been there ten thousand years, mm. bright shining as the sun, could you imagine? We've no less days to sing. God's praise oh, Then when We first Begun Somebody in here better make a noise Jesus And hallelujah Grace like rain Falls down on me And hallelujah And all my stains are washed away They're washed away And hallelujah Grace like rain Falls down on me And hallelujah And all my stains Are washed away They're washed away away they're washed away you sing it and hallelujah come on somebody falls down and hallelujah and all my stains are washed away we got one more in us come on and hallelujah Grace like rain falls down on me. And hallelujah, and all my stains are washed away. They're washed away. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your love, and that today we're going to get to see people baptized and life's changed, and it's a proclamation. It's not saying that baptism saves you. It's no, it's what your word says, that when we profess with our life, with our tongues, that we have given our life to you, it says that we need to go in public and be baptized to show the world and proclaim to the world that we're no longer living for it. We're no longer sheep following the world. We're sheep following our great shepherd. That's what scripture teaches us about being sheep. And so, Father, I just ask that you would just lead us tonight as our pastor comes to speak. Would you anoint his words? Would you soften our hearts, soften our ears, and uh, just bless this church as we're doing powerful things in your name and for you and to all things be to your glory, Lord. We pray this in your name. And all God's children said, amen. amen. You may be seated, church.
I told every single one of you that when I started this series, it was dealing with news type material. Uh, the news material is based on uh, what is news in our life as Christians that we need to hear and we need to be involved in. I, I told you when I started this series, I don't watch the news anymore. Um, I've reached a point in my life where uh, um, I can't deal with uh, sitting and watching and paying attention, attention because I just wind up mad yelling at the uh, television set. And uh, if you're anything like me and my particular lean in life, um, I, don't, uh, I don't do well with idiots. And uh, um, living in a, uh, a world of people that it seems like we're having a competition on who can be the dumbest um, is, a, uh, is a struggle in my life. This subject matter uh, is another subject matter that will, um, for some of you, work really easy. For a few of you, the society and culture we live in, it'll be fun. How Christians think about work, about success, and about wealth is really important, particularly when I live in an age from church that the message has become super confusing. It is, it is something that, that dominates one part of the discussion and doesn't dominate it like it should be in another part. And so if you'll allow me tonight, I titled this Just the Facts, and that's how I would like to present this this evening. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 in your notes, and if you didn't get one of those on the way in, you can uh, go grab one. If you did get them, um, cool. If not, if you're on your cell phone, that's fine too. Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 10, we're God's master Peace. And there's an important part there that's just simple grammar. The expression gods, we are God's masterpiece. Whoever you are, whether you are a new Christian, an older Christian, or maybe you're an individual that right now is just looking at the lay of the land and you're trying to get this all figured out. We're God's masterpiece. He created us. He made us. He produced us for a certain reason. It says he created us anew in Christ Jesus. That's the salvation experience when I ask Christ into my life. So I have become a born-again believer, and I am new, and I am different, and I am his masterpiece. The next part says, so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Okay. Start on the premise. Hi, mankind was created. Yes, I'm one of those people that believe that Adam and Eve were the first people. I also believe that my Savior sat down and said that I created you, men and women, as individuals to work. How many of you ever heard that word work? All right, let's all try this again. How many of you have ever heard that word work? Okay, it's supposed to be part of our lives. Adam and his wife were placed in the garden to take care of it. We were created to work. Simplistic. We were not created to sit on our butts and do nothing. That's not what we were made for. That's not what God designed us for. For a whole bunch of us in this culture that we live in, we become Christians. And somehow in our mindset, we think that that means I check out my ticket to get to go to heaven and that I spend the rest of my life just kind of doing what I want to do and that God's not involved in that process. Forgive my expression being from down south. That's bull. Scripture. There was a story called the parable of the talents that God put together that Jesus shared. And he said, I want you to catch this. I want you to listen to it. I want you to pay attention to it. That This is how you're supposed to live your life. And so when I say your life, in your notes, it says the word investment. And when I'm talking investment, it's not a sermon on money. You can use a tiny little bit of it for that. That's not where I'm coming from. How many of you are old enough in this room to remember Bozo? How many of you saw Bozo the Clown? Okay, do you remember him? Saturday mornings, he was beyond popular. He was back when clowns were funny and not nightmares, okay? Tons of products came from him. Everyone loved him to death. Everyone talked about him. We had lunch boxes of him. We had puppets that looked like him. We had books that had stories on it. We had little banks that got made from him. All of this stuff was involved in our life. My favorite toy that ever came out of him was this toy that they called Bounce Back Bozo. Okay, bounce back bozo was something that we hit, kicked, smacked with a bat, did whatever we wanted to do. And every time we knocked the thing over, it kept coming back at us. We had a blast with it. What we really had fun with was the dippy children that were not coordinated enough to smack the thing and get out of the way before it came back up. Which you will forgive me is a whole bunch like life. Because every time I turn around in this culture that we live in, you're getting smacked, you're getting a right hook, you're getting kicked, you're getting knocked down, and you get a choice. 
you get to get back up or you get to lay there and whine and cry for the rest of your days. I'm sorry. Life is not fair. You are going to be accused. You are going to be smacked. You are going to be treated rude. You are going to have things happen to you that you don't understand. You're going to have things happen that make you mad. Life is going to knock the living daylights out of you with everything from jobs to divorce to death to disease. And unless you get it figured out that if I don't make the choice to get back up, I will spend the rest of my days laying on the ground. I chose to be like Bozo. I decided that I would live my life by saying, Father, I don't like this thing that has happened to me. It has cost me buku of dollars. It has cost me my name. It has cost me friendship. It has cost everything I can think about respectfully, but I'm not dead yet. I'm still here. Every single time I go through the thought process that I'm still here, I have to deal with the thought that if I truly believe in God, and I truly believe he's my king, and I truly believe he's my Lord, then if I'm here and I'm alive, he has a purpose for me. There's a reason why I'm still here. might not be comfortable. The world might not have treated me sweet. But I find that every bit of it goes back to a thought process. How do I feel about what God said? My Jesus looked at people and told a story. And when he told that story to him, he said, I want you to understand that each one of you have been given gifts, you have been given talents, you have been given them for the common good of your family, your friends, your church, the people around you, but you have to understand what it means. On your notes, number one, it means ownership. I cure 99% of the problems in Frank's life when I realize that everything belongs to God. It doesn't belong to me. When I grab ownership, I automatically have problems in life because I start trying to push my agenda instead of his agenda. The story is told in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven, this is Jesus talking, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. You're smart kids, man going on a long trip, that's God looking at us and saying, I have done these things for you, and now I'm leaving you here. He called together his servants. You got your pen? Circle the word his. They are his servants and entrusted his money, not their money, not their stuff, we're stewards. He said, this is my money. This is my trip. These are my people. I have entrusted all of this into their life, and I am leaving and going to be gone. Got it? Got it? So you're here. You're his kids. And he said, this is what I've done in your life. S.D. Gordon, long quote, but hear it out, says, we have nothing to do with how much ability we've got or how little but what we do with what we have. The man with great talent is apt to be puffed up, and the man with little talent to belittle his talent. Poor fools. God gives it, much or little. Our part is to be faithful, doing the level best with every bit and every scrap that he has given us. And we will be that if don't miss. We will be that if Jesus' spirit is what controls us. If I'm controlled by Frank, ownership becomes an issue because I have a problem just like you have a problem with being told what to do. How many of you have a head as hard as I do? Okay. I don't appreciate when someone says, this is what we're going to do, and you didn't ask me for my opinion. And so I struggle with a holy God that looks at me and says, Frank, this is what I've called you to do. And these are the talents that I have given you. And the baby in me jumps up and goes, but that's not what I want to do. He looks at me and says, Frank, I want to remind you of something. I own this, not you. It is my kingdom, not yours. Rush Limbaugh always said it best when he said, talent on loan from God. That's us. Some of you in this room have been given phenomenal talent, unreal talent. My point number two is the word allocation. God has given each one of us unique talents. 
The Bible says in Matthew 25, 15, he gave five bags of silver to one, which means some of you in this room are five bag people. To another one, he gave two bags of silver, which means some of you in this room are two baggers. And for some people, he gave one bag of silver. The problem with that is, is it was divided in proportion according to their abilities. And then he left on a trip. Get what he did. For a few of you on this planet, he gave you five. For a few of you, he gave you two. And for some of you, he gave you one. You do understand that the instant you say that for some of you, he gave one, that sets up a system of crybabies. Because we want to go, I don't get it. Why didn't I get the five? Okay, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. God has given each of us a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. I don't want you to miss the words. Here's our problem. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, one bag of silver to the last one, and he divided it according to their proportion of abilities. And then he left and went on the trip. We as human beings go, oh, okay, that's talking talents. It's talking gifts. It's talking great things that God's given me all this really cool stuff. How many of you have lived for more than 50 years on this planet? How many of you have learned, a few of you in this room have been like, I don't want to tell my age. Okay, lie. For those of you that have lived a whole bunch of years on this planet, have you figured out that some of the gifts that God gives us are not really that great? And that sometimes the things that God puts in our life are pure hell. Have you gotten that figured out? See, sometimes we read this thing as God giving us talents, and we think of it on the good side. We go, oh, he gave me this, and he gave me that. We never stop to go, I have a father who looks at me and said, Frank, I'm going to do all these great things in your life, but there's this one thing I'm going to bring into your life that's pure hell. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, he says, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others others. When they're troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. Allocation. It's God looking at Frank and saying, Frank, I have brought some really wonderful things into your life. I have given you some gifts that are beyond thought. But Frank, I have also brought pure hell into your life. And the hell that I've brought into your life will force you to trust me, to listen to me, to pay attention to me, to seek comfort from me. And then the people around you that go through the same hell that you do, I will use you in their life to help comfort them, to help bring things in their world that need to be brought into their world. Does that make sense? You're not an island. You've been stuck here for a purpose. And I say stuck here for a purpose respectfully. You have been stuck here for a reason. God looked at you and said, I have something I want to do in your life. And for some of you, it's to give you unreal things that blow people's minds. And for some of you, it's to bring your world crashing down and to bring pain in your life that makes you stand there and force yourself to stand back up and go through the pain and go through the hurt and get knocked down and get crushed and get back up and say, God, your grace, your your strength, your mind, I will walk through this so that I become sensitive to look at one of my brothers or sisters in Christ and when they're walking through the same hell that I went through, my gifts get used to help them go through it. I don't get to be an island by myself. My point number three is utilization. It's a gift that's been given to me that I'm supposed to use. The one servant took his five bags and he invested them and got five more. The other servant took his two bags and he invested them and got two more. That's what it means when it says we're God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus. Every one of you that are sitting here that have been Christians for years, God many, many years ago put stuff in your life, invest it and use it. Some of you that are brand new believers, God put stuff in your life. We don't associate this verse of, of me being his masterpiece and created anew and given these things. We don't associate it with work, but we should. I'm supposed to bless my family. I'm supposed to bless my friends. I'm supposed to bless my church. 
For crying out loud, we're in the middle of a building program. I, I was thrilled to death when I heard him announce that we've gone from, at the beginning of, of the year, back to almost 150 grand down to 8,300 bucks. Isn't that phenomenal? Yeah. You do realize that as soon as we get the 8.3 paid off, we now have to go the other way? Okay, we've been going down, now we've got to go up because we have to pay for a building. And I listen to people every once in a while, they look at me and go, well, we can just build a nice metal building. I ain't building no dag-blasted box. The reason why I'm not building a black dag blasted box is, is because you ever have you ever heard of honoring God? You ever heard of walking in and saying, Father, don't miss, Father, I'm going to do my level best for you. I'm going to take my life and do it and live it and be it for my family, for my friends, and for my church. I'm not going to live the opposite side. Matthew 25, 18 says, But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. He looked at the master and he said, I knew you were rough. I knew you harvested crops that you didn't plant. I knew you gathered crops you didn't cultivate. I, I, I knew that you were ornery and didn't like it when things weren't done a certain way, so I didn't want to dare risk it. So I didn't put myself out there. One of the orneriest answers in Scripture is in Matthew 25. God looked at him and said, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Please take that and put that in your world. God's looking at you and saying, Hi, every single one of you, I put something in your life. I, God, invested something in your world. I want a return. I don't want you sitting on your butt in the pew waving at people. I don't want you spending your life sitting at your house and waiting to collect a check. I want you pushing. I want you working. I want you serving. I want you breaking your back. I want you taking the talent that I gave you and getting every shred of ability out of it. In a small interview in an old folks' home, they sat down and they interviewed 50 people over 95 years of age. They asked every one of them the same question. If you could live your life over again, what would you do differently? What do you think the average 95-year-old said? I'd eat more M&Ms. <laughs> they said they got all kinds of answers. They said, but there were three answers that came up that they thought were profound. One of the first things that every one of those old folks said was, is I would reflect more. I would sit and pay more attention to what was coming from my life and think about it. I would put more of myself into that. Another thing they said was, is I would risk more. You guys do understand that when you die and they put you in the hole, what you've done, you did, right? Right? It's over. And yeah, I know you're going to a great place. I know the food's way better there, and I know you don't have to pay the dag-blasted government taxes, taxes. I got it. But ain't nobody want to live their life to walk up to that point to get ready to go home and say that I died with the music still inside of me. I want the music out of you. Just like these old folks, I want you to risk more. Another thing they said is that they would do more things that would live on after they were dead. Your name means something. And sweetheart, whether you like it or not, you're going to get old and you're going to leave this world. Your name means something. You don't want to live in the world of not hearing your master say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Number four that's in there is something called accountability. We're going to give an answer. Our culture doesn't dig that. But Matthew 25, 19 says, After a long time, their master returned from his trip. This is Jesus talking. After a long time, their master returned from his trip, and he called them to give an account of how they had used his money. That's symbolism. That's God looking at you and saying, What did you do with what you were given? The life that I gave you. 
The talents that I handed to you, whether they were a whole bunch or just a few, what I gave you, what did you do with it? Romans chapter 14, verse 12 says, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Everyone in this room that's asked Jesus Christ into your life, would you please say amen? amen. Okay, try it again so we make sure we're all on the same page. Every one of you in this room that's asked Jesus into your life, say amen. amen. You guys understand that the moment you... Theology lesson. The moment you ask Jesus Christ into your life, all sin forgiven and gone. Everybody understand that? Okay, that means when you stand before a holy God and you look at him, he doesn't see sin. How many of you in this room are twits, just like I am? How many twits do we have here tonight? Any jackasses in the building besides me? How many of you cussed this week again? How many cussers did we... Gracious, thanks a lot. I said, damn it, in one sermon, and it messed up the whole church. Okay. Back to the sermon. Listen. When you ask Christ into your life, his death on the cross, all sin, the price was paid for. All. Not a little bit. Not all the stuff you did up until you got saved. Everything you did before you met Jesus, while you met Jesus, and everything you're going to do in the future. Every single thing is forgiven. When Jesus Christ looks at Frank, he doesn't see a sinner. I am a born-again child of the King. He sees me through Jesus. Therefore, when I die, I don't have to stand before God and answer for every time I said, damn it, in the pulpit. I don't have to stand and look at him and go, yeah, I remember when I did such and such. He's like, whoa, 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 time out, son. That's under the blood. It's forgiven. It's gone. You don't have to worry about that. But when he says give an account, he is going to look at me on that day and say, Frank, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with the talents that I handed you in life? What did you do with the five that I gave you or the two that I gave you or the one that I gave you? And I don't get to stand there and go, Oh, I was kind of busy, God. You are going to answer for that. In the life that you lived on this earth, the Bible say, says that it will be shouted from the housetops in heaven. You got that? Let's make sure we're clear on theology. I've been in this book ever since I was a little boy, and I'm 63. I learned something about my Savior. I am a born-again, forgiven child of the King. But this born-again, forgiven child of the King has talent on loan from God that I have to answer for. Got it? It's important. Don't miss. The part that every single one of us tend to overlook is, is he said, I gave you five, two, or one, and I divided it in its proportion to your abilities. That means the master understands that some of you in here are one-baggers, and some of you are two-baggers, and some of you are five-baggers. And again, this is where we protest. We get ticked. Why didn't I get the five talents? Because you didn't get the five talents. Did you ever ask your mommy that? Mommy, why did Jimmy get the bigger piece of pie? Because he was faster than you, you little slow butt. <laughs> we can't handle that. But James, I wanted to be equal. It's not equal. Can we all get this out of our system? We were not created equal. There's some of you in this room that are phenomenal, and there's some of you in this room that are twits. And us walking around in our twittledness and looking at people that are phenomenal and go, why can't I be like that? Because you're not. All of you stood here singing and worshiping with us tonight. Isn't it really cool listening to people stand up here and play instruments and do what they do? Some of you can't play spoons in this room. Some of you, if you sing, sheep run. And us sitting around and going, oh, why can't I be like Zach? Because you're not Zach. Why can't... Huh. 
you wouldn't want to be like Zach. <laughs> you know in the Bible how the Bible teaches us that much is given and much is required? I, 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 don't ever forget that. When we whine and cry about the baby that got the five and we got the one, remember the one that got the five has a whole lot more accountability than the dude that got the one. Sometimes respectfully you need to shut up and be glad you got your one. Because if you had to live in the world of the dude that got the five, you'd wish you hadn't. But so we all understand, so I finish this properly today. Guys, we are not created equal. I, 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 but don't miss. We are equal in the area of work. It takes the same work with five and two and one to get something or to get nothing. Where I am equal is in the amount of work that I can put out. The master measures success by degrees of effort, not by the amount that I produce. Isn't that good news? Number five is motivation. Fear keeps us from using our talents. He looked at Jesus and he said, I was afraid I'd lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. And look, here's your money back. And basically what Jesus was saying to him was, you weren't wasting money, son. You are wasting the opportunity. The parable of the talents, it's not about salvation and it's not about your righteousness. It's about fulfilling the calling that you have while you're here on earth. Did you get that? It's about God put you here and put something, don't miss, God put you here and put something in you and he said work, push, sweat, fight, war because I gave you talents and use it. Because if you don't use it, number six is called application. If you don't use it, you lose it. The thing that we dippy run through our heads, I, I love what he said. He ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. He's not talking about heaven. He's talking about now. Me living and working and doing. If I live and work and do, God said, I'll compensate you, Frank. That's my point seven. You'll be given a reward. And I'm not talking about heaven. Look what the verse says. It says, to those of us who... Don't. Every once in a while there's a verse that goes, boom. Let it go, boom. You ready? To those who use well what they're given, don't miss. To those who use well what they're given. What do the next five words say? Got it? He's not talking heaven, guys. He says to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. Don't whine about your one. Take your one. You're a one-bagger. Work hard. Live with your one. Deal with your one. Don't bury it. Don't be afraid. Don't hide it. Don't walk around being scared of what God wants to do. Live your life as whole life stewardship. Serve and do. To those who use well what they're given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. You want to go from a one bag to a two to a five? Use your one well. But he said, for those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Those are rough words, but hear them. Matthew 25, 23, my last verse for this evening. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Um, almost without fail, those words have been used in church life to talk about dying and standing before a holy God. I have no problem with that. You're the one who is master of what's going to be said to you when you stand before God. But that's not what this verse is talking about. He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling your two or your five. And I will give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The Greek, now, this moment, let's celebrate together now. This is now, not later. Yeah, there's going to be accountability. Please don't miss that. But if you want God to bless you, take what God gave you and use it. 
Please hear these last words. Take what God gave you and use it. Don't do what we as human beings have a normal tendency to do. Bertoldo di Giovanni, even our most enthusiastic lovers of art in this room won't know who I'm talking about. But Bertoldo was Michelangelo's teacher. And when you say the name Michelangelo, every single one of you in here are like, whoa, whoa, I, I, I know who you're talking about now. When Michelangelo was 14 years old, 14 years old, he was brought before Bertoldo. He was obviously gifted. The conversation that Bertoldo and Michelangelo's daddy had back and forth was pointed and powerful. Bertoldo looked at him and he said, Sir, I am wise enough, don't miss this story, I am wise enough to realize that gifted people are tempted to coast rather than use their gifts. And so he spent weeks working with Michelangelo to get this young child prodigy to be what he was supposed to be. One day he came into the studio and he looked over at a piece of art work, a piece of sculpture that Michelangelo was working on that was beneath his ability. He went to the side part of the room, opened up a shelf and pulled a hammer out. And as he walked up to the piece of sculpture, Michelangelo realized what he was doing and started screaming at him. Michelangelo said in his writings, I will never forget watching Bertoldo take that hammer and shatter the artwork, and as he was shattering the sculpture, he screamed at me something that Michelangelo said I will never forget. He said, Michelangelo, talent is cheap. Dedication is costly. I would put before every single one of you sitting in this room, what are you doing with the talent that God has given you? Talents, cheap. Dedication, that's costly. That's why the church in America is dying today. That's why in the average church, to go to church and to meet somebody new is rare. Tonight, in a few moments, you'll watch individuals get baptized. Do you know how many churches in America haven't baptized anyone in 10 years? Do you know how many churches in America in the last 20 years have baptized two or three children and it was their kids and that's it? I'm not bragging. I follow a God who said, even in the middle of a pandemic in America and around the globe, I, God, still sit on my throne. And as king, I am still calling people to me to come to me as Savior. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me, please? Father, it is extremely important as we gather tonight that this whole service that we've been together, that we've worshipped you and that we've sang and that we've lifted you up, it's important, God, that all of us realize that it's just about you and that as individuals following you and serving you, you want to do something powerful in every one of our lives. But Father, that doesn't get done through religion. It gets done through knowing you as Lord and Savior. It gets done through you being our King, our Master. It gets done through us turning our lives over to you. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I was a little guy when I turned my life over to Jesus. He changed my life. And if you're sitting here tonight, I'd, I'd ask you the question this evening. If you were to die tonight, do you know where you'd spend eternity? 
do you know that you'd go to heaven? And I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about being good. I'm talking about having a personal relationship with Jesus. And if you're here this evening and there's a part of you that says, I want that and I want it bad. I'd like to know Jesus for sure. And I'd like to know I can spend eternity in heaven with him. Then right where you're sitting. He said, if you would believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, he'd be your Lord and he'd change you for eternity. And I'd just like to ask you tonight, if you're sitting here with us and you need the Jesus that I'm talking about in your life, then right where you're sitting right now, just inside, pray this prayer. Inside, just say, dear Lord, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you were buried for me. And I believe you rose again for me. Come into my life. I make you my Lord tonight. Thank you, Father. Not worried about what another person did in this room. It's between you, God, and me. If you prayed that prayer and you asked him into your life, he said in Romans, whoever would call on the name of the Lord, he would save them for eternity and forgive their sin and change their life. And I'd just like to ask you, if you prayed that prayer and you meant business with it, not worrying about what anyone else, if you did that, would you just look up here at me? Don't worry about what another person does in this room. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Don't worry about what another person does between you, me, and God. Thank you. Appreciate that. That's awesome. You can look back down. Father, thank you so very much for what you're doing in each one of our lives. God, as we sit and watch people get baptized, use this in a very powerful way. Use it to change lives and use it to redirect our world. And Father, as other people tonight have asked into their life, work in their world, this day, we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Zach's going to sing for us. We're going to go get ready to baptize. So, Zach, please, sir. You know, we're going to do something a little different here. We're about to see a baptism. Ain't that right? I don't know if many of you have uh, seen a lot of them. There's some of us in this room that are here every time there's a baptism. And there's people in this room that maybe they've never seen what it's like. There's no more strong points in our life than when we can give our life, our walk, our being, our soul, our spirit to the king and to find that moment. And for everybody in this room that knows our Lord, that believes in our Lord, well, we remember that moment when we turned our eyes to him. And what a day that was, amen? What a day that was, amen? And we gave our life to him. And so today we're going to watch some people, some new believers, some firm foundation believers, profess right in front of you that they believe in the same God you do. And so when we baptize them today, don't be quiet. Don't be silent. I mean, it's amazing. I have to admit, sometimes we're silent because we're in awe. I do understand that. And every time we baptize somebody, every time we baptize, it's amazing, trying to keep my composure. It's amazing when I see, you know, the young children get saved. That's amazing to me, and, and hallelujah, and God be all the glory. But when I see someone that's uh, a little further down the road with their age, when I see them get baptized, when I see them give their, uh, give their life to him, man, I tell you what, because... Kids are stubborn, but they're young. So when we see the people who are a little further down the road in age get baptized, that's going to take some moving in the Holy Spirit, ain't it? Because we're some stubborn people. 
we are some stubborn people. But aren't you glad we got a stubborn God? Mm. So let's just get ready to watch this baptism. You guys can talk among your, amongst yourselves and uh, just get ready. And when we see these people baptized, when he says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and they go down, when they come up out of that water, you better cheer with everything you got. Don't you dare tell me when you go to a, sporting, a sport outing that you're just very quiet. You cheer when your team wins. You cheer. Well, our team keeps winning. Our team keeps winning. We keep winning people to Jesus, and that is all that matters in this life. So when they come up out of that water, you better remember that. In fact, I actually wrote a song. I'll play a little part of it as we're waiting. It's called Brand New. And the whole song is talking about how I want to be made brand new. So I'll play just a little part of it. Uh, I'll play a little part of it for you as we're sitting here waiting. In my life, I've seen the sun and the rain. And many times I felt that pain. Lord, we've been talking and my knees are worn and tired. From praying alone as the tears burn my eyes. Lord, guide my way. Cause I need to change. Take me down to the water and soak away my sins. Oh, I pray to Jesus, these stains ain't permanent. Cause I've made mistakes and I've been ashamed. And I've run away from my past. Lord, take the old me and make him like you. Because I want to be made brand new. That's what's going to happen today when these people come up out of that water. That's what's going to happen. So you make sure you, that you as believers, as their brothers and sisters in Christ, as their family, that you let them know we're here supporting them. And we're about to watch some lives do some amazing things. Amen. Let's give God some praise today, church. Everybody in here. Amen. Amen. You guys can talk. And as we're waiting on our pastor to come out. And here he is. So just, uh, pastor, we're ready for you. Daniel, have you asked the Lord in your life? Yes. In obedience to the commands of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I have baptized thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. They, uh, they made me wear a microphone tonight, and they said, they kept saying, it's only a 9-volt battery, Pastor, you know? It, it gets wet. And I'm like, I can see me standing in heaven, God going, you trusted Zach and Michael. <laughs> so if we're still here when this is over, glory to God, okay? <laughs> Two more. this way. Step over this way. There you go. Jason, have you asked the Lord in your life? In obedience to the commands of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize thee, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Take your time, big guy. 
Two more. Okay, I want you to stop. Oh, oh, oh. Let's right here. There you go. Hands up on your chest. I want you to step over this way a little bit. There you go. Man, have you asked the Lord in your life? Sure have. In obedience to the commands of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in Him, I baptize thee, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Him in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. And I'm not dead, praise God. How many enjoyed watching all them get baptized tonight? Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord together, okay? Father, it is an honor to be here tonight in church. It is an honor to be able to see individuals that have asked you into their lives stand here and make a public profession that I believe Jesus died for me he was buried and he rose again and the old me is dead and buried and I'm a new person thank you for watching Jason be able to make that proclamation and Matt be able to make that proclamation and Danielle being able to make that proclamation God work in their lives they are more precious to us than gold we love them, we appreciate them with all of our hearts. And your people are chosen by you, and we love and adore them. Thank you for letting us be their friends and their family and their church. We ask this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand together, find somebody, give them a hug. Lord bless you, and you're dismissed. And yeah, you can clap. Amen. <laughs>